you go. So we're going to uh, call to order March 20th, 2018 meeting of the uh, North Andover Planning Board. Uh, we do expect uh, Mr. Simons here in a few minutes, but we'll get started with some of the discussion items. Uh, so why don't we start with um, uh, the Glade Great Lake Lane, uh, Tom Zarico, Street Acceptance Warrant Article. <laughs> Gene, were you going to do any introduction on this, or do you want me to just jump in? Why don't, what, Tom, why don't you start by telling us about this particular project, and then, Gene, I'd like you to kind of go over the street, this is our first street <laughs> acceptance, at least since I've been here, to kind of what over the normal process is and where this fits in with that. Okay, this this project, uh, the timeline I don't, I, I don't have to the month, was approved a couple of years ago. Uh, we started it in May, built the road, uh, subsequently built the five homes. They've all been occupied for uh, a year or more, some as long as, uh, as, long as two and a half years. Um, the site's been stable. Um, every lawn out there has been uh, taken care of for the last year or, or two or three years by the uh, current owners. Um, the only thing that we hadn't done uh, to complete the subdivision was uh, the finished pavement, which we did this past fall um, uh, towards the end of the, of the paving season. Um, so the, the, the subdivision is, is totally occupied 
it's um, it's stable. Uh, I think we've gone through um, uh, most of the paperwork for the street acceptance. We don't have our conservation certificate of compliance yet. That's the one reason I think why this is coming forward right now as a uh, as a citizen's petition. Um, we've been in compliance with CONCOM since the beginning. Uh, we uh, uh, had uh, an inspection just before the snow started to hit when it felt like spring a month and a half or two months ago. Um, and we have a blueberry bush which died in our replication area which is very difficult to replace right now. And we have about 150 or so square feet of lawn that even though it's been mowed 50 to 100 times um, that isn't grown in sufficiently for the satisfaction of, of CONCOM right now. So we may have to throw down some more grass seed or roll in some sod. Of course, we can't do that. I'm hoping we get compliance at the next meeting with those two items, uh, uh, given a little bit of courtesy based on my, my history in, in, in doing these things. So we're hoping we have compliance from CONCOM next week. Um, and then I think, I think most of our paperwork is done as far as the street acceptance, Gene, isn't it? There's requirements uh, for street acceptance that the Board of Health, the Conservation Commission, the DPW, and planning all have to sign off on what's called a Form K, Certificate of Completion. Um, as Tom said, conservation will meet on March 28th. We're hoping that he can work through um, some of her comments. So she has submitted some comments to Tom. They've met on site. Um, it's going to be a matter of whether the Commission does issue the Certificate of Compliance, which is a requirement. DPW provided some comments. I trust they've all been They've all been addressed resolved. and I think been commented back from DPW. Uh, yep. And town council also reviews the entire package. She had some minor comments, most of which have been addressed, but the remaining one is he needs a certificate of compliance. Um, that being said, should we receive all that by April 3rd? I would like to have it on the planning board agenda on April 3rd and have a vote either favorable or unfavorable because the next step is to go to the board of selectmen, which would be that following Monday for a street layout plan. They vote on a street layout, which essentially is an as-built in this plan in front of you. That requires a seven-day prior notification to all abutters, property owners, and mortgagees, um, mortgage holders, I'm sorry. So the timing of that mailing has to be at least seven days out. Should CONCOM give them the approval on March 28th, we can mail it the next day and meet that requirement. But when it gets to the Board of Selectmen, they would like to have Planning Board's opinion on that. So. Everything lines up for it to occur in time, um, but it is contingent on conservation. So what is it that we are voting on in terms of approving? What is it that, that, that we need to find that has been complied with? That it has met all the requirements of your decision. And the street, our policy for the street acceptance is on our website. It's a fairly lengthy document, but that's what we do internally. And, okay. and at that point, town council will also submit a recommendation. So we'll get a report. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Tom, what kind of what's the status of the road right now in terms of ownership? Uh, that's owned by my my development company uh, exclusively. There are no liens or, or, or uh, mortgages on it. No. Uh, so none of the, the owners don't have easements or rights as of yet. No, they, they don't. We actually re reserve all, all the fee in the road. It's just okay. something we learned uh, mm -hmm. a number of subdivisions ago. <laughs> <laughs> to simplify the process, we reserve the fee in the road. They have the rights of rights of access, uh, you know, to get to their homes, of course. Uh, but that's the only right they don't have an ownership right. Uh, that's all all resides with my company. And the remaining bond funds, it's approximately eleven thousand dollars, are in place to get through street acceptance. Right. Um, so, so we want that to come to completion before we release the remaining bond funds. So it was the anticipation when the subdivision was made that this would eventually be a public yes. road. Okay. Okay, so um, then you would like us, or it makes sense to hold this to the next meeting for April 3rd? Right, so this is just yeah. discussion letting you know that a citizen petition has been filed, that you will have this before you on April 3rd. Um, at that time, in the file tonight was the restrictive covenant, the decision, the certification letters from the engineer. So each time the building went up, we needed, before a CEO was issued, to have the engineer certify it was built according to the plan. For the next meeting, I will um, anticipate having DPW's approval, certainly Board of Health because they're on water and sewer. I, I have visited the site. He's complied with all of our requirements, and Town Council will also provide a memo. Should all that be in place and CONCOM does issue his certificate of compliance for April 3rd, 
I will be asking if you can make a recommendation either favorable okay. or unfavorable at that time. Okay. This was just a short in the next meeting for us, I guess, really. Okay. No, it's, it's better to ask these questions now. Okay. okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Um, why don't we do, um, we do the master plan update? Sure. Uh, public forum was this past Thursday. Um, although not as attended as well as the first one, the first one far exceeded everybody's expectations. So I would, I would estimate probably about 70 people were there, um, which is in line with what the consultants had estimated. They, at the first one, they thought if we had 100, it would be an exceptional turnout, and they anticipated there'd be less this time. Um, I will say that everyone was really engaged. They participated in all the stations. Um, the forum was really an introductory and then breaking out some of the goals and strategies that we felt really wasn't a strong consensus on during the first forum. And so there's about 125 strategies of which, I forget the number, but only about 40 were voted on at, at this public forum where people actually went station to station and rated each um, strategy whether they felt it was appropriate, somewhat liked it, neutral, didn't care one way or the other, somewhat disliked or did not like it all. Um, so the consultants are taking all that information back and compiling it and then we'll turn around, you know, again a report to the committee, to yourselves with the anticipation of having a final draft in June of this year. So some of the members attended, if you have any feedback. Um, important on the website is the public input form where they can just make comments, but there's also a survey that includes those 125 strategies. Unfortunately, it'll probably take 20 to 25 minutes, which is a little more than a regular survey, um, but they can skip, only go to the stations they wanted to go to. They can submit it um, partial or in full, and all that data is a survey monkey that will be compiled as well. Within the, I've left that up for two weeks. So March 30th? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. So I, I think one thing that I thought, I know I saw a bunch of, a bunch of you there that, that I think will be helpful is we're, ultimately this is going to come back to us to look at and discuss and vote on. But if there are small topics that anyone finds particularly interesting to them to maybe kind of take that and, and try to think about that. Like for me, I thought the, uh, I saw something about uh, in-law apartments, you know, and I had never really thought about that particular issue, and I think it could be a bylaw that we that is narrowly tailored could be really beneficial. So I'd like to kind of focus and look on that as part of you know my thought on the master plan. If there's other things that people saw that they have particular interest in, whether it's you know the the lake or whether it's open space, you know, kind of let us know during this discussion. And if people want to kind of take an active role in kind of leading certain areas, I think that would be definitely very helpful. While we all talk about the the whole plan as a whole? I will say for the most part, I had to manage station, so I didn't get to each one individually, but I was very interested in the housing one, because I would say that that still remains a topic where people are at different spectrums on that. Um, and so I did ask them to send those to me the next day, pictures of them. And that's where the check marks really spanned from <coughs> agree to disagree, different than others. For the most part, most of the check marks were somewhat agree or agree on across the board and almost all what I could see from my station but the housing one still remains so I'm interested in what their feedback is going to be to that data um, it, it's it, it's unique I think um, it's not unique I don't think to each community I think people have very strong opinions about no more housing versus multifamily versus more single family no multifamily um, but that one I think will be if anybody has a strong interest in that might want to really read into that detail as well Committee is, is terrific too. I was really impressed by it. all the people that, because I hadn't really met them or had you know one-on-one -on -one conversations. What a great group! Yep. They, to be applauded, right. really. They they ran a great uh, they ran a great meeting. It was really nice to talk one-on-one -on -one about each topic, and everyone was so knowledgeable. So congratulations. Yeah, job well they've done. They've been great. They've been very very supportive of the whole process. Do you know of any surprises that came out of this last forum? I don't think surprises. I, th I think I anticipated the housing being like that uh, mm -hmm. from the comments that we've gained to date. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't hear surprises. So. And have you gotten any feedback from the members of the committee on their reaction or responses no. to the 
Yeah. No, we broke up that night. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's, they, they do meet a week from Thursday again. Yep. OK, anybody else? Uh, great job. All right. Well, we keep. Uh, I definitely encourage everyone to take the survey to, if you can and provide details or you know, email or send in details to you know, thoughts to Gene and, and just keep going with the process. Okay. Um, so, Gene, there was one item that did not make our agenda. Uh, could you just give a brief description of that? And then I think we'll, it was something that's not familiar to me or Monica, something that I, I was not aware of. So, I think we'll take a motion to accept that as added to our agenda for tonight and just hear some brief details about it. Okay. Uh, the project is located at 128 Dale Street. It's a application for a watershed special permit. Um, and the project involves the addition of a one-car garage, car part, um, the expansion of a, a bedroom and associated landscaping. And we have the applicant here, uh, Steve Mason, um, to you know to talk about the project if you if you want to open it. Um, the application has been reviewed by the various departments, and stormwater review was completed by uh, DPW. And where do we stand with legal notice? Um, it was advertised on March the sixth and March the thirteenth. Okay, and just didn't make our agenda. Yes. Okay, so I'd um, I'd entertain a motion to uh, add one tw one twenty eight. One twenty eight Dale Street. One twenty eight Dale Street to our agenda for tonight as a late file. I'll make that motion. Is there a second. Yeah, sure. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that's added. What we'll do is we will open since legal notice has gone out. We'll add that to the agenda. So one twenty eight Dale Street is now on our agenda. We'll open it. We're not going to take much in the way of evidence because we don't have most of our information from the town. But if the applicant's here and wants to tell us a little bit about the project, uh, that would be great. And then we're going to continue it for the next hearing, for the next uh, planning board date, which sure. probably would have happened anyway, just so you know. <laughs> we were, it wasn't going to get decided I, today. But I, I hope it won't get continued again at the next meeting. But See what happens. Um, so since you guys haven't seen anything, I'll just give a brief summary. It's a, it's a, uh, um, it's a ranch house that we're putting on a uh, one-car garage and uh, a carport in front and a bedroom extension in the back. Went through uh, zoning board um, a couple of weeks ago, got granted the variances for the, it's in the watershed district, watershed, whatever, but I got a variance for that and some setback variances. So that's all approved. Um, you guys are my next step. Uh, there'll be some associated landscape and we're actually trying to improve the stormwater management by removing a, uh, a driveway that's right next to some wetlands uh, to the opposite side of the house. So it actually will improve the, the stormwater management. But I mean, until you guys have seen the, everything, it's, that's about all I, I can say. Okay. And do, can we get a the copy of the ZBA decision for our packet as well? Okay. Um, unless anybody has any compelling uh, questions right now, we'll wait till we get some documents to look at for next time and uh, take it up on the, on the next meeting. All right, appreciate All right. it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, so do you want to do 1429 Osgood Street? Yes. <clears throat> so again, um, we have an empty lot on the section related to the architectural style for a proposed um, project at 1429 Osgood Street, which is located in the Corridor Development District 2. Um, we have uh, Liberty Enterprise here with their engineers from Allen Major Associates. And um, this particular project has been uh, reviewed over the over a, a course of a, a time here. They, at um, one point, it was a possible self-storage facility that didn't quite work out, but this, um, this developer is looking, to, is a landscaping company, and they're looking to do kind of like a contractor's yard here. Um, but again, um, they wanted to come before you just to discuss their, protect, their perspective architecture style just to make sure that it complied with section 16.6 uh, .6 under design standards of the bylaw. have in front of you here for our first slide is just the locus to show its current location. Um, we also have images of its current condition. You can see that it's um, kind of in in uh, kind of disrepair. So their new their new project will definitely be uh, sprucing that up and bringing some new life to a, a parcel that's been uh, underdeveloped for some time. 
is everybody familiar with the location in the building? It is the former technical training right across from Holt Road. So this is an image of it. it for the most part, it's been their office for some time, but the rest of the building has been, um, I won't say abandoned, but it has not been used for the warehouse that it had been previous. So really there's no windows. It's kind of boarded up facade. There's chain link fences. There's a really large retaining wall that runs down the side of the property. The parking lot is in disrepair at this point. Um, there's been several prospective buyers, but these guys have recently purchased it and they have plans to develop it. Um, so I think to the left, let me bring up the locust again. Yeah, the Breen landscaping. Yeah. And the other so side is Baker's that? Farm. Barker Farm. Barker. Barker. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's uh, right across the You should know it's been there for 400 years, so <laughs> <laughs> you might want to get to know them a little bit. I should know them. Yeah. <laughs> So the bylaw calls for, in the design standards, New England architecture in the CDD3 zone. Um, and when they came to the counter and they had some perspective on the architecture they were looking to design, I, myself and Monica offered, if you might want to come in and just get perspective before you spend a lot of money, that's really what they wanted to do. So they're in their design format and they intend to file fairly shortly for site plan review. Call any definition of New England architecture in the bylaw, right? No, it is not. In fact, it basically says applicants are encouraged to use traditional New England architectural elements in the design. Then, of course, that leaves it up to the board's interpretation. <laughs> and and you saw the building that was there. I mean, it's it's not typical New England architecture today by any means, and it needs a serious facelift. Well, it's just an interesting question of New England architecture for and, and John. I kind of want to hear your opinion on this because. For for our house for residential, I can have a picture of New England architecture. For a commercial building, I'm not sure. I think of what would be New England architecture in terms of commercial, or should there be a distinction? So it's just an, I don't know if you guys have encountered well, this in I, the past. I mean, I think that uh, I'm trying to remember. I think the idea was that anything that we would build that would be new would be sort of if you will, villagey. Maybe that's a different way of saying the same thing. I don't want to get into all the features, but you kind of, I think you have an intuitive idea of, of what would constitute traditional New England architecture. Um, I, I, I think more of the case here is that you got a building that's underutilized and, you know, as much as I'm not sort of super, you know, I prefer New England architecture to modern architecture, but I also realize the reality of the situation here. And, you know, getting something that is a lot nicer than what's there is, is going to be infinitely better than, than the alternative. Are you, you, are you talking at all about, um, are, you, are you just changing the facade or are you actually doing any incremental construction? No, we plan on doing quite a bit of site work there. So can we're going to basically do everything over outside the building. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us oh, your sorry. name. Oh, sorry. I'm live. Jeff Oliver. Okay. I am the owner of the property. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Uh, so we want to run our business from that site, and we plan on having a tenant in the other half. So we have to do a complete remodel outside. We obviously, the building has been, yeah, semi-abandoned for quite a bit of time, yeah. so it shows the signs of that. So we want to uplift, you know, give it a facelift on the front. Uh, we are going to do the office over inside. The actual existing office space that's in there is in uh, kind of the middle of the building. That was just done four to five years ago. So that would be for the proposed tenant, and that is actually fairly new. Okay. Uh, but you're we, not talking about adding square footage or a second No, floor not right now, no. Like that. Okay, no. so you're just basically going in a, a gut level refurb of what? Correct, there. yeah. We had, you know, ideas that we when we were trying to figure out what to do with the space, but we have honed in on what we wanted to do, and it doesn't include any addition. Yeah. Okay. So this would be a mixed-use building in the future with your contractor yard set to the back. Correct. And unknown use yet at the front of the building. Yeah. Or uses. Okay. It would, it's 18,000 square feet, I believe. Right? Twenty. The whole building is around 21.6. What kind of uses would you envision in the first floor? Uh, whoever's willing to pay us rent. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, we'd like, obviously, we'd like to get something that's in the allowable. This is CDD3 now, correct? So we'd like to get something that's in the allowable usage. Uh, that would be our first goal because that's easiest. Uh, we do need a special permit for our business there. 
uh, which we intend on going for. Um, so we're in the final stages now of the design process and we have, we've done a wetland delineation, we've done a septic plan, we've done, you know, a site plan, uh, we did a traffic report, uh, we did a flow, hydro flow test on the hydrant out front. So we're in the final stages of being able to submit this, but we just know that that fine print was in the zoning and we wanted to make sure, I agree with you, I, I'm, I would like it to look like that too, but I'm kind of dealing with the a very unique building here and I'm just trying to make it look good without breaking the bank. Um, and, and could you talk a little bit about the philosophy or approach you took to the uh, architecture? Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, John Kiveney, I'm the architect with CAC. Um, so I guess from a design perspective we, were, we had two main goals. One was as you can see from that photo really opening the building up to the street. It's down on a hill, down below on a hill you that whole front facade, there's no windows, no openings. So that was perspective number one, is really trying to open it up to the street. And I guess number two is it's an existing CMU building. Um, it needs a heavy repoint job, so really modernizing the facade to get it suitable for actual occupants inside. Um, so I guess if you look at that first view from what you see from Osgood, what we're doing there is we're creating a new storefront entrance that's surrounded by um, a fiber cement board that we're going to that we'd like to have there that really mimics wood, but it's in a soft color, a wood-like color. And then surrounding it, we have, and there's a sample right there. Um, we're open, surrounding that front entrance, we're gonna have big windows. We'd like to have big windows there and metal paneling as well. Um, but as you can see from the existing photos, in the middle, I guess, middle section of the existing building, there's these scalloped CMU walls. So we're trying to introduce two different textures of the same color palette for the metal panels, where in between the windows we'll, we'll have a corrugated metal, and then we'll have actual metal panels above and below that. So still trying to retain some of that, I guess, somewhat interesting architecture of the existing building, and bringing it modern with uh, metal panels. And then as you progress, around the building, the second view, which is the second entrance, that will, we're using the existing, you can see, we're using the existing entrance there, just cutting <coughs> it in that same um, fiber cement board, and still utilizing the metal paneling there. And then going around the building to the third view, still trying to keep with the same style, but create different entrances, so it's not the exact same throughout the entire building. Um, same feel, but slightly different. So we have an entrance overhang there, we have vertical vertical metal panels instead of horizontal. Um, so I guess going back to our two main goals, it was really opening into the street, but then modernizing the facade. And the roof is shot, so that needs to be done. So the trim around the roof line will be new. Um, I think this was really the best approach to try to give this thing a facelift. It is kind of low and. John's right, when you drive by this building, it's pretty much unnoticeable. Um, so we're trying to get you know more light into the building. Uh, it's very dark inside, so we wanted to implement a lot of windows and uh, you know again, just give it some kind of facelift that we could work with that scalloped block in the front. Do you have to put mechanicals in the roof for it? Yeah. Work? Okay. Uh, that's kind of, we're gonna bring a gas line in. It's electric heat right now. Um, so we this gas on the street. And we've already applied for a permit to bring in gas So where the mechanicals are gonna go is There may be potentially one or two units my goal is to not put them on the roof I'd rather I don't like the way it looks because the building sits so low I think it takes away from the look and I don't like piercing the roof whenever I don't have to so our goal is to try to keep them on the ground, but I don't know that if that's possible yet Yeah. We haven't figured out which route we're going to go. Once we figure that out, that will determine what air handle is going to have to be on the roof. Yeah. Um, like I said, we're going to try to minimize that as much as possible. Sure. We're going to do a lot in the exterior facade <coughs> these entrances to make them stand out. The, the building is very drab. When we drive by, we want people to notice the building. So we want this, this wood feature on each entrance to stand out as you drive by. There'll be new complete sidewalks, landscaping. The, the parking areas will all be completely new. We're gonna get in touch with DEP to see if we can come up with a management plan for the overgrown 
uh, vegetation in the front to try to open the front up. We want a sign, we want plantings. We want to make this a building that everybody drives by and says, wow, look at, look at what they've done to this building. And that's, we just want to know that we're on the right path to do that. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is TJ Carroll. I'm uh, Jeff's new partner. Uh, and so business partner. Business partner. Uh, 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 <laughs> sorry, there's anything wrong with that. So you'll be, and then we have uh, Chris who's with us. We have project managers. We're all working together to, to get this done and make it. Hopefully yeah, it should be very nice when it's done. I mean, basically everything outside is going to get completely removed and redone. Uh, we're working with Allen and Major down in Woburn. They've done other projects with us before. They do a really nice job. Yeah. So they're helping us work through all the stuff outside, but we just wanted to make sure we were on the right track for John so that when we did submit this yeah. formally that we were not going to be out of compliance with that yeah. little bylaw. And um, before I forget... We have been talking to, and this is, I guess, an important question for the look of the building, especially because this sits so low. We've been talking to a solar panel company. What are the thoughts on putting solar on the roof? Hmm. Well, we have a new bylaw that we're, we're hopefully proposing um, through yeah. town meeting. And I mean, personally, I think the more solar renewable energy that we can have in town, the better. And I think our bylaw is very encouraging. I mean, it's still in draft form, but I think it's very encouraging of rooftop solar. A so. flat roof or is it a? It's a flat roof. <laughs> so are you talking like just regular roof mounted? I think regular roof mounted, I don't, at least for me, don't see a problem with. If you're talking like 10 foot poles with ones that are no. you know, moving yeah, around. It would be a regular roof mount. That would, yeah. that would, that would not be. Yeah, I mean, they're offering minimum. some good incentives right now for yeah. that, and we're a good candidate. Uh, there's some good sunlight there, so it's something that we've been trying to move forward. But I did want to ask that a question because that's definitely something you're going to see. No, I think, we, especially with roof mounted, you know, we want to encourage that. Um, so I think I think that's okay. Is you know, obviously, I would factor it into your designs, you know, <laughs> color schemes and all of that. Um, yep. And we'd love to see pictures of that. Um, and I don't know if you. I, with the solar, where they're putting a little bit of a parapet up there to, you know, and again, I can't tell the visibly what you see from the street or anything like that. Yeah, our like original, that. like when we did some mock ups, our original design included a parapet wall, but it didn't really hide much, you know. We'd have yeah. to put a 20 foot wall up okay. front. Yeah. Just because, again, the building, whoever built that building originally, they sat it so low in the lot. Lot, yeah. And the road is high, so yeah. it's going to be inevitably you're going to see that roof. So I think the goal would probably be to get, uh, and I, I'm concerned how these things look too, I think try to get the most attractive solar panel if such a thing exists and, uh, and try to make the front of the building look as good as possible and run with it, you know. Um, we're only going to do it on a third of the roof, too, so far. Um, so it's not going to be the entire roof. So we haven't. Uh, we have two more weeks to say yay or nay on that um, from the solar panel. I mean, from the tax incentives. You know, and they'll offer to pay a portion of the roof, so it's a good little bargain for everybody. Just make sure you have a structural engineer. Right? Yeah, we do. Yeah. 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 Yep. Without question, they're not r really heavy. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we'll definitely have that all reviewed. Anybody else, uh, Peter or Chris? Yeah. Save my questions. For yeah. Me. Okay. Uh, so I think I think we I think you're on the right path. I mean, okay. I don't think this goes too far. I mean, classic New England architecture. I, I don't know, but I think it looks like a lot of the other buildings around in a nicer fashion. So yeah. if you stick with. That is kind of the guidepost, you know, a nice building that doesn't look kind of crazy modern yep, yep. or postmodern, then I think you're on the right path. Yeah, I don't think it's over the top. I know everyone's going to miss what's there, but yeah. we'll do the best we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you close your eyes and just. Honestly, when I saw this on the agenda, I looked. Uh, You're like, thinking, online, like, what? There's, there's a, a building there? Exactly. That's exactly yeah. what I said to yeah. myself. Yeah. I thought that all the time. Yes, I know. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> 
Yeah, so we're trying to make it the opposite of that. So. No, I think. Fencing, yeah, I think we can wait until site plan review. Yeah. You know, we know all the uh, ins and outs of that, and we, Alan and Maze has done a good job at addressing everything. So when we, again, when we submit this, I'm sure we'll have everything that we need to get past that. It's basically the special permit that we're, as far as our business goes, we're really concerned about that because the outdoor space is the most valuable thing there for us. So we just have to, and I had to do the same thing in a project we just got done in Woob, and so we're, we kind of know what you want, and I think we hit all, all the points. Okay. And we are a, you know, our bread and butter business is landscape construction. I mean, we do larger projects. We have heavy equipment. We do site work. So I think we can do a really nice job out front there to make that pop from the street. You know, we're going to put in good-sized plant material. We're going to put as much plant material in as possible. I think we can do it, you know, something that's tasteful. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited the way that this is going to look. It has a lot of potential. Um, but... It's not there yet. All right. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, no, thanks for having yeah, us. I think you put a lot of thought into it already. Which I think is a good thing, so. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Exciting. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's next? A couple housekeeping items on the warrant, the proposed warrant out of this. Okay. Um, 127 Marblehead. You agreed to sponsor at the last meeting. I did swap out the map to be showing the general business lot surrounded by the R4 lots. Um, so that's the one I anticipate including in the warrant itself. So is that on for a public hearing today? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah, oh, so for the warrant articles, the legal notice printed today, April 3rd will be the opening of the public hearing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, and the wireless service bylaw. Again, at the last meeting, um, consensus was to go to 500 feet, and so that change has been made in number five, and I anticipate submitting that in that format as well. Okay. Have you gotten any comments on that yet? <coughs> Not. <coughs> there were some um, of the Foster Street neighbors at the public forum speaking to the cell coverage kind of planning in general. Um, they were satisfied that it, it was on one of the boards, it was discussed, and people were in favor of trying to proactively plan <coughs> before the next application. Okay. So, um, Erica Forey is at a finance committee meeting, and he said he will come straight from there to here, so I would expect you so to So as soon as he gets time. here, we'll do the Sutton Street one? Yes, which I know everyone's here for, but he is As soon as he way. gets here, we'll do um, that. Any comments from town attorney on other pending matters? Meaning? Cell towers. Um, I believe she was filing a response today. Yeah. But other than that, we haven't had a discussion. Is there anything that we're required to do? No. No. Okay. So I want to no. know. Thank you. It's all about the, the record. Okay. So last week I introduced the bylaw codification effort that is going on. Um, this, this week there is what we anticipate just for, um, so there was a draft warrant article. Everybody, oh, let me open that first, sorry. The town manager submitted this in draft format, but he said this should be relatively um, close to what is the final warrant article. The codification includes all of our town reports, and so the zoning bylaw one is broken out because that will be included in your public hearing for zoning. Um, and so this indicates there'll be some non substantive changes as well as just the renumbering. Um, that concerns me about this is that are there going to be literally any changes in the text? Yep, so that's what I have. So to if there are, then who is codification? Is a change, a minor change in the eye of the, I mean, that makes me like really nervous. Uh, so like, I mean, I, I agree, but I think if you look at the, so sometimes it'll be like an of that should have been an or. I'm you okay know. with that, but I, think I mean, it just like, I don't want to leave it open-ended. 
It's it's not. There's, no, there'll be a list of the list is right changes. here. Changes. Okay. And, and to be honest, um, Eric actually went back and pulled out the original warrant. So when there were discrepancies found, we went to the original warrant, and it's just been over the years things have just dropped out of the bylaw that were not intended to be dropped out. One of them is the automobile section, um, auto service stations in I believe eight four. It's just not there anymore, John. So this is that example. So 8-4, from that bracket on, is no longer in our bylaw, but yet this is the warrant article that was approved. So from that bracket all the way down to number, or letter B, is that right? Sorry. Looks like I'm confused. The, the ABC there, John? What page are we on? So there's a note oh. from item down it says from here on dropped out of bylaw so, so our bylaw ends down. with number two that first sentence when this is the warrant article that had been approved but what year was that warrant article i don't yeah, know that doesn't look like it's a warrant article it looks like it's the actual bylaw it is uh, gene that's from 1979 not my yes. fault. <laughs> You're right. It's the bylaw. But um, there were no warrant article changes to that language since that bylaw. Okay. Okay. Um, so but, some. but as far so again, going back to the list itself. I mean, is everybody going to see the entire list? My understanding is going to be written in the warrant that it could be seen at the clerk's office. So this, this document, as well as the entire draft general code document, will be at the clerk's office. But who's, like, who's going to be the editor of this? I mean, if we're going to make all these changes, who's the person who's actually going to do it and decide where, the, where and when language changes? only this language changes. So only the ones that have been identified and are on file at the clerk's office would be the bylaw updates. And general code is going to make those bylaw updates if it was approved at town meeting. So who is going through the document to see if we're in agreement with what general code suggests? I assume general code makes suggestions, gives right. to the departments right. that are affected by so each provision, they review it and see if it's correct. So Eric Kapori and I, in this list, which pertain to the bylaw, went through each one of them. Town Council has reviewed when it was for the town bylaws or general code. It may have been the town accountant might have had to review one. The town clerk might have had to review several. But when specific to the zoning bylaw, we did that. And when you did go through and check all of the general code recommendations you, you've given us some examples where you went back to the original and you could see that pieces have fallen out yeah. did you go back to original source material in each instance in each instance no uh, in So if you look at number six, convenience is being struck for conveyance. So there's some that just makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Right. And for legal occupants and legal documents. But, but I guess ultimately, and I'll admit to being a little bit confused about this and even why how this came forward, but I see there being two possible ways you could deal with this. You could say to somebody like Gene or Monica, go off and find every error in the Bible that's clearly a, you know, a clerical error or something like that, and we'll make all those changes to the bylaw for next year, and they'll all be there. Somebody, anybody who wants to see them can see them, and that's what we'll vote on. As opposed to saying, we have a bunch of errors in the bylaw. We're not sure what they all are, but let us change the bylaw and, you know, I, d I, don't I believe we're doing the form. I don't think we did that. So okay, well there were others that we said, no, just leave it as it is. I guess can't. my point is that we're going to have a list of all the changes. 
this this is the list. This isn't the final list, but yes. That okay. automobile one's going to be built in here. Okay, so that's fine. As long as we have a list yes. in advance of all the changes, then I'm okay with it. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not It's not. you can change it in the future. It's, okay. These right. are the changes okay. that are being made. Okay. Right. Now I get right. it. Right. Okay. And, and again, this number two on the screen, it had accepted, and they pointed out that should be accepted. So yeah. it, the, the, anything that was fairly substantive, we went back and we found the original bylaw, um, number 20. Well, could you look first at, hold, don't, don't. Go move. ahead. Go back. Ten. Wait a minute. I, I have to go to the bylaw section here. That's where we start, right? All right. Fine. Okay. So, number twenty, where the acres is underlined, we did check that the original warrant article had five acres. Customarily, the original warrant article said customary. On number eighteen. The number 22, where it says longer. Accessory building is no longer than 64 square feet. It was larger. That's our shed pretty much protection, that if it's 64 or less, you can be five feet off the lot line. Anything larger, you have to meet the underlying zoning. Okay. Um, the number 24 went back to the original bylaw. Number 23 was a double negative that just didn't make sense. Is it possible to? in the final version of this document uh, to put the reason why the change was made? Just for anyone just who reviews this in advance of town meeting to have a, a better understanding. Just note. There, I feel like there, that exists for a lot of these, just not all of them. Like number 27 might be one where it would be helpful to have an explanation or it just says it's amended to, well, I guess it says missing text. Do you think that it needs more than those explanations there? I don't know if it would be helpful. I know so 27, code. again, was a, a case where we went back to the original yeah. warrant language, and that's what it was. And do it had dropped out of the bylaw. Do we have the comments from general code? I mean, usually they submit a list of comments. Yeah. It might be helpful if town council is okay with it to make those available so people can, if they want to cross reference and see it. There's a list that says, hey, you should think about doing this, you should think about doing this, you should think about doing this, and these are the responses to those. Yeah. So it might be helpful to have those available for people who want to see yeah. what the question was. Is, is there anything in these changes that, imagine that, you know, the improper version of something made it into the bylaw, and then a person relying on that went and did something. <laughs> and is there a possibility that any of these we make somebody non-conforming where they were conforming before? And how do we, how do you do, is that just like any other uh, uh, non-conforming existing use or? I, I think it would be, but I don't think there's any case of that. These are all pretty non-substantive. Okay, so that's what that's I'm That's the intent, is they're non-substantive. Yeah, they're not then, okay. Anything they suggested that we thought would be considered substantive, we said no, we'll, we'll do that when we update the whole okay, bylaw as part of the okay. master plan process. Okay. They're all intended to be non-substantive and that's the word I used in the legal notice was yeah. recodification for numbering okay. and non-substantive changes. Yeah. I mean, I think if we have to explain it, tell me we ought to probably yep. emphasize that uh, because somebody will raise it, you know, just as an issue. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do Sutton Street? Sutton Street, yeah. Um, so at the last meeting, again, it was just a discussion item as it is tonight. Um, you were interested in getting a little bit more detail on other B2 parcels throughout North Andover. Um, so Eric Afori has submitted a memo that I believe you have in your package. And he can walk through that. Yeah. Good evening. Good to see you all again. I, I, um, I don't know if you've had the chance to read it. If you have specific questions, I think it pretty much uh, tried to address three issues. One was um, the question as to the applicability of Section 7.46. I think this goes to the question was um, if you looked at the three parcels that we're talking about, it, it amounts to a little over 4.5 acres. Um, and the language is pretty clear that the five acres land area has to be for the use of residential. So the interpretation there would be that um, 
if, if you, for instance, took an acre out for the senior center and the parking area, then we're talking three and a half. Um, you couldn't say four and a half. You couldn't use the land being used for another use to meet the five acre, the current five acre land area. That was uh, one question. The second question was, um, again, going back to specific sizes of each of the uh, parcels in uh, the B2 district, uh, and I think uh, lay those all out, and then the consequences of reducing the minimum land area. So uh, I think I try to assume uh, a conservative number, frankly, for uh, the proposed project. Um, I anticipate that uh, that four and a half acres is going to come down more than, a, slightly more than an acre, potentially. Um, so uh, maybe closer to three and a quarter or three, between three and a three and a quarter acres for the, uh, for the residential component. Frankly, I don't know until we do some engineering on that, right? It's not me doing it. But, um, and then uh, when you look at the, what I call the uh, B2 areas, uh, most of them are single parcels, uh, but a couple have contiguous parcels that collectively could be, I guess, uh, uh, amassed at some point or, uh, you know, connected and then for instance, if it's three acres, three acres culled together uh, for residential use. I will say the ones, I think I try to point out that, uh, again, um, one of those areas uh, of, I think, of four contiguous parcels are right at the airport and are in the flight path and, I'm sure, uh, subject to FAA requirements. Can you go back to the mm -hmm. I just point out 7.46. Sure. Can you tell me how you got to that conclusion, or who can? Because I, I don't I don't read it that way. The way I read, at least the way I read it, is a parcel of parcels collectively comprising at least five acres of land located within a B2 district. So I think we actually have that. We have a parcel, two parcels of land, or multiple parcels comprising at least five districts, eligible for a waiver for residential multiple family dwelling. So to me, the waiver is for the residential building. The, so you couldn't get a waiver for the you couldn't get a waiver for the uh, the way I read it. You couldn't get a waiver for the senior center, but you could get a waiver for the residential use. But I don't see but that we the residential use again, has to be five acres. Just so you know, this was in consultation with town council. That's, uh, that's yeah, all, you yeah. know, and and uh, but and you know, and it says right after that for residential multifamily dwellings and townhouses. Right, described. but does that modify the five acres? I read that as modifying the waiver. That the waiver is made for the residential. So if you had a, you couldn't. Do a, even if it was five acres, you couldn't do a waiver for something that wasn't a residential multifamily dwelling. But I don't see anything that says the use has to be five acres. Yeah, because I don't think anywhere in our zoning bylaw do we inside a parcel right. carve it up again and say this specific use is, and, is that. So I agree with you. And I guess I'm, I, but again, and maybe those, that's ambiguous, but I, I just don't understand why you would take the narrow reading of it when. The, the I think there was something, and, I, and off the top of my head, I apologize. Uh, there is something in the bylaw that this seemed to be more in line with. Um, and then uses, <coughs> again, the parcel, this will be parcel. And there will be two distinct parcels. Yeah. And so then you're going to have, let's say, a three acre or three and a quarter acre or three and a half acre parcel, whatever it is, for the residential use. You will no longer have four and a half acres. Okay. I mean, that might be, that's actually probably a, a more reasonable argument that you're you're dividing the thing into two, so the parcel that you're actually building one is, is smaller. Okay. I mean, you know, one of the things we can do is if, you know, we, again, we, we, we don't want to move, I think the reason why we're pushing it so hard is we don't want to move off the five or as far off the five as we can, because okay. yep. Four, we could probably swallow. Three is a little tough. Maybe what we do is we, between three and five, we make it a use subject to special permit, and uh, as opposed to just it's already subject to special permit. No, but it's it's 
is that use subject to special permit? I mean, the waiver is subject to special permit. Oh, the waiver is subject to special permit. And the use itself. So we get a, a, so that we get a special permit on it anyway. It, 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 which is distinct from site plan review. I mean, right. yeah. we have a discretionary authority. If we yeah. don't like it, we could say no to it. Yeah. yeah. So even if we went down to three, we could yeah. we still have the special permit. Yeah. I just. I guess I just read it differently. But I mean, even if you read it differently, isn't it the case that even when you add these parcels together, you're still not at the five? So it doesn't, they're in 4.56. Is that, is that right? So even if you read it the way you read it, I don't think that solves the problem. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I just, we could just go down to four. And I worry if we go down to three or two, or the original proposal was to get rid of the. Entirely, then we open up all these other particular yeah, ones. No, so. I understand, and I, I so I yes, agree. I agree. I agree that we should, if we're, I don't think we should necessarily get rid of it altogether. I think we should reduce it to a, a smaller size. But I can understand the town's position that, you know, if they're going to be in a position to come back here and somebody could say, hey, but there's two different parcels. And somebody, you know, it's not necessarily going to be all of you right. and everybody agreeing with your reading yeah. the next time. Makes it more challengeable. Yeah, or you could make it, you know, I think along those lines, you could make the argument that it's one parcel when we approved it, because uh, you could you could take a parcel at any point in time and carve carve it up, even after the fact. Couldn't we make that part of the record? So yeah. even if we're not here, as long as you look at the record, it says this decision was based on the single parcel yeah. as a whole. And then that way we could could live with the floor. Right. Yeah. But I think to Jen, I mean, I, I know I'm pushing too, but I to backtrack to Jen's point is if we like, if we think that this, this is an appropriate project and the use is appropriate and all of that, to make something that is the least challengeable going to three or three and a half would be probably the best approach. We just have to keep in mind these other parcels. And then we do have the special permit, which is, you know, uh, that is reassuring. So, okay. So of these other parcels that you listed? What's that? Do you know which of the other parcels you have listed are also in the watershed? In the watershed. Trying to think, I don't know if well, I would assume the. Um, so yeah, that's going to be general zone. Right. I, I, I believe 1,000, 1,018, and 1060 are all in the watershed. 1018 is Dunkin' Donuts, and they received a watershed special permit. Right. 980 Butcher is Boy not. Butcher right? Boy is 1077, and Paducah Bank went through a watershed special permit. So I don't know if the entire lot is in it, but certainly a portion is. 1210 Oscar Street is not in the watershed. And now if I work my way down, 999, I think is, and the others are not. So the only reason I ask this question is when we talk about potentially opening up more sites because of taking away the five acre, if we were to do that, I'm just looking for are there other potential unintended sort of complications or consequences that maybe we would have wished we had thought about. And for any parcel that's in the watershed, I think that just deserves our knowledge that, hey, that's also in the watershed and deserves some extra care. That's, yeah. Well, we could carve out the watershed. You could carve out the watershed. You could yeah. say you can't get a waiver in the watershed Great. unless you're five acres yep. and three and a half okay. everywhere well, else. I mean, that's the kind, Something of, like that. kind of thought process that I just think we ought to, yeah. you know, go through. So, you could carve out the flight path as well. Well, the five plants will take care of itself with the yeah. FAA, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm just thinking that that would take out some of the other parcels that may be borderline impacted by a change down yeah, to three. I, I kind of like that idea because I think we shouldn't assume that the FAA is going gonna, is gonna to eliminate them on our behalf for this reason. Their height restrictions depend on how far away you are. It's not just in the flight path. It's how far out you are. So, yeah. I mean, we, we could find out. Don't flight paths change sometimes? I mean, I, I, I don't know if well, we if not we, so much know. with, you know, unless you move the runway, but. But, we don't, I, but, I, I just, but no, yeah. I'm, I'm agreeing with yeah, you that, that I don't want to just rely on, you know, sort of general knowledge of what the FAA flight path requires. If we want to rely on that, then we should know what is the elevation restriction for each of these addresses. Yeah. 
And if we, I mean, yeah, if we can get information. Otherwise, I, I would, you know, I prefer the approach that Jennifer has said that we would just exclude them. So, um, so you want the um, take each property around the airport and see. Uh, I'll talk to the uh, airport director and get that. What the I mean, formula is. I know there's could we, a. Could we just easily? I mean, just to sort of minimize the amount of work here, but right. still accomplish the same thing. Could we say this waiver applies to everything unless they are in the flight path or a water, like watershed district, and then that protects those parcels of land. I mean, is this and that sort of protects us down the road too. If the flight path changes, it's right. sort of. Do you, there a site? Is, is this project a Sutton Street one flight path? Is there any issue? My, my understanding is no, but I'll confirm that. I think that would be a good idea. Yep. <laughs> is the flight path a documented <laughs> yeah. area? Yeah. I would assume yeah, we could get that. It's on an aeronautical chart. Could we get that as well? Yeah. Sure. And I mean, you can. I, I agree with doing the due diligence, but if you look at where the runways are, you know, the flight paths are parallel to the runways. So this is um, right in between both runways. So it's the least likely area that you would have a flight path change. We should just, uh, the we Sutton just Street. confirm that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next thing you know, we're going to have a nautical chart. Then I'm going to get hey, really no, excited. I know. Yeah, you'll be really excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the B2 issues. Okay, so... Um, the deadline for submitting these warrant articles is before our April 3rd meeting? Before the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. So as far as submitting them for the warrant print, do you want to make an adjustment to the language? Well, why don't, we, um, why don't we go to public comment, probably okay. not about this particular issue, and then we'll circle back to it. Okay. So there's an associated map amendment article as well. Just okay. So we don't why don't we... If there's anyone here that wants to speak about um, this article, anything about this article, why don't we do that now? Hi. Hi. I'm back. So I'm Rachel Scarry. I'm 19 Surrey. My neighbor. <laughs> so we took the, and we knew it was a preliminary drawing, but we took sketch that was used at the last meeting to kind of illustrate our concerns about the zoning. Um, and I guess, you know, our request would be if you are to do a special permit to say that you are going to increase the height, um, could there be some concessions or some commitments to that property to protect the privacy? Because by elevating the vantage point of the building or new structure that will be built on the property, it'll change our privacy dramatically. Um, I did take a look at the property that Minucci has developed in other areas, and they are beautiful buildings, and there are use of some really good trees there. So, you know, if there could be some sort of commitment to say, okay, we're going to increase the height or, you know, whatever that special permitting is, but the responsibility and obligation of that developer or owner of that parcel is to maintain, you know, a perimeter of trees. Um, one thing to note is that on their plan, they omitted to include number one and number three Surrey, which are located right here next to my house on the other side. Um, and it, it abuts directly the senior center. Um, so again, that would you know, be another additional you know, residential property that would be affected by the new zoning. Um, and then the other thing that we really noticed was the traffic and that kind of change. So we wanted to see as a, you know, as a neighborhood, what steps could we take off that, you know, off this platform to look into changing our street path to either a one way, a dead end, parking, you know, restriction, parking permits, because we're assuming with the 284 additional vehicles plus visitors, there's gonna be some people that maybe someone has a party at, you know, the new complex and it, there's a bunch of cars all of a sudden in our, our street. So, you know, could we somehow schedule some sort of meeting or what is the appropriate steps for us to take to look at changing our neighborhood to protect um, the community that exists currently? Um, so, those are all actually really great points. Um, they don't necessarily come up now in our process. Agreed. So Agreed. they're great, so but we please raise them because we'll continue yeah. to raise them. 
those there will be a site plan review process and a special permit process if the zoning change is allowed. So if the zoning change is allowed, then the project can go up. Mm -hmm. If no zoning change is allowed, then they're going to build their other project, which is going to be taller. Mm -hmm. So um, if the zoning change is allowed, then we come to the, the traffic studies. I think the, mm -hmm. the changing the road patterns is a really interesting idea, and I think you work with planning and the board of selectmen and and the planning board and everyone to kind of do that and the developer it, they seem very open to discuss these and discussions I've heard that i've heard all good things and again like i said the properties that they do have currently are really nice and I, you know of the things that could be built in our backyard it, it's a beautiful you know the right. Kittredge facility is really nice um and it seems like well classically built but you know from a perspective of privacy mm -hmm. you know like yeah. the elevation changes it's a dramatic difference and I would assume that a lot of those trees are gone so right. you know assuming this project's moving forward we're just asking for some sort of concession that okay you're gonna let them go sky high but could there be a commitment on their end to, to put you know Colorado spruce or Douglas fir which are trees they have in their lots I think you have yeah, I'm glad you looked at the other properties because I think you really have to put all this stuff yeah. into a real context and you see that I think that this developer does have a, a, a good development style but also I think he is mindful of uh, what he builds because he's lived in the community mm -hmm. his whole life. Um, our process, it's, it's a difficult process frankly because in, I've been on this board for a long time and the hardest projects we ever have are the ones where residential property abuts mm -hmm. a different commercial use because there always is inevitably some level of conflict that exists there. But the process that we have, which is a combination we call site plan review, which is the normal thing where you do screening, but also this, we, we keep on coming back to this term of the special permit, is that they have to demonstrate to us that they can build the height that they want and it won't have a del deleterious effect. We actually have a little bit more control in this circumstance than we do when it's just purely site plan review. Mm -hmm. So I think there's reasonable safeguards that exist here. I realize that it's not the same thing as the status quo of today. And, and, and I think we're accepting you know, change is inevitable. Yeah. We're not saying, you know, oh no, we want to, you know, we realize that change is, is likely coming, but if there could just be some sort of yeah. sensitivity to the existing scenario. And, you know, forgive my, Misunderstanding of it, you know, I'm not a planning board aficionado. No, well, you, you, <laughs> not, <laughs> yet, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Lucky you, you would have joined. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Um, but more or less, I'm just trying to visually represent some of the concerns we have, and you know, as things move forward, I guess I'll be vocal as you can see. But um, you know, when would the site data or site? Planning or what so, so what the potential process, and I think we heard a little bit about the timelines last time. <clears throat> so we're gonna there's gonna be a vote on a on a zoning amendment at the um, town meeting. Mm -hmm. That's in the uh, end, end of May. After that, I think he said a year to eighteen months of <clears throat> till for building and things like that. Uh, I, actually, I anticipate that. Um, uh, if successful that town meeting that will probably start the special permitting process uh, the end of the year closer to the end of the year okay. so Whether that's like November ish I don't know okay so if they come back so the town because it's a public-private the town and the um, developer will try to submit something in November I think we would strongly encourage and I would expect that the town would reach out to neighbors hold <laughs> maybe yep. some public meetings, things like that, informational sessions. I think the developer seems uh, open to that, which I, so I think we would strongly suggest that. The actual official process, say it started in November, we would have multiple public hearings like we're doing now, except it would be about these kind of things. Um, so um, raise them now, raise them then. Uh, we, just, we just can't comment on a project that we don't have in front of us yet, except in theory. Thank you. Watching the progress of the project as it happens while it's being built, that, that is, that's huge that you come in and have feedback for that. I mean, that, that happened in my own neighborhood. People started to build something that they weren't given. I'm not saying that this would happen here, but they didn't have permission to do that. And the only reason they knew is because we came and said, did you know? So mm -hmm. it's great that you're here. And it's, it's useful. So please come back. 
will. <laughs> <laughs> April 3rd, right? <laughs> Thanks. Could, could you just email us a picture of that boy? So yes, we hope. Uh, do you have an email? I don't <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anyone else? Good, good, okay. Uh, any questions, comments on that portion? Okay, so Jean, go back to your question from before. Do we want to make any changes now? Is that the question? Right, yes. I know you haven't, it doesn't seem that you've decided on a lower number than the five. However, this one strikes it in total. So there'll be opportunity once it does print in the warrant to do red line edits in a planning board report. Um, but. So it's going to print in the warrant before the public meeting, before the public hearings? Um, I don't know their print date, but what I discussed with the executive secretary for the town manager was turning these in March 22nd, which is two days from now. Okay. Anyone have any particular thoughts on what we would think about doing? I think it's, it feels to me it's either we use a threshold of three acres or four acres, and we exclude properties in the watershed and in the flight path. I mean, I think we agree to that. I think that's a consensus. And the question is, do we do we do three or four acres? Right. And what about three and, and if a the data that comes in leads you in a different direction, then it can be redlined yeah. at it. What about three and a half? I see the 999 Osgood is 3.24. I'm not sure if we want that one in or out. I would be concerned about three and a half. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, um, so it does have a special permit, and we would want to exclude the watershed and the flight path. Makes sense to me. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. Someone want to make a motion, and we can always. So, but I it's, it's, please still get us the rest of the data that we're looking yep, for, yep. And, and we can it's, still it's, adjust it. But I was going to say, so you, I mean, you can adjust it at some point. Yeah. No, let's. Right. We're going to okay. continue to work on yep. it, but yep. if it's. If that's kind of the consensus that we have right now, and, and it gives everyone a sense of what we're looking at, so maybe people can make comments if, on it. And certainly, if I get a sense that it's say three and a quarter or three and a third, I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. You'll let us know. I think actually, from a point of view within the scope of the warrant, you're better off going below and coming back up, which I right. think you can do. So, right. So I would make a motion that we we recommend this article with a. Uh, a size limit of three acres, but subject to uh, excluding uh, parcels in the watershed and uh, in the flight path of the airport. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And I'll confirm the submission dates, but they're always in before you open the public hearing. Okay. I would expect. Okay. Uh, so I think we're all done with Salton Street for tonight. Uh, we'll uh, just the uh, zoning map one, do you need that? So the zoning map, we need a map itself. So all we have is the text for okay. the zoning map. And I think you said you were going to ask them for that. I'm trying to. I don't know. The, what if we don't get one by the 22nd? Do we have to have that? What do you need the map for? Yeah. It's for everything. We have the, um, I mean, the, the we district. have the um, uh, I mean, parcels. every parcel that is zoned at. The three. The oh, three no. parcels are changing existing zoning to a new zoning. Oh, they are. Oh, that's and right. And that's a map yeah, amendment. Need, yeah. No, right. I'm sorry. Right. That's we don't right. need the B two. Yeah. We need the changing of the zoning for the Sutton Street. Right. Do we, but do we need to depict it on the map dated? We need a new zoning map. To well, I have map and parcel numbers. Yes. And we reference the assessor's maps. We can talk to council about it. The ones it? that I've done, we've always included we've always a map. Had another map. We've always had that language on right. top. So. We can certainly talk to council if she doesn't think we need it. If if she does, it's pretty easy to do it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. And we'll have the public hearing on the third. Yes. Of April. Okay. So do you need a vote on that or no? No. Okay. Um, we just the explanation is the other item that we'll need for Thursday. We typically put an explanation in on these. Oh, okay. Titles. Yep. On the thing. Sure. Yeah. And circulate stuff through you through to to the board. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Okay. And I believe 
the last article is the Sola Bylaw. So we've made some edits from the last meeting. I have left and not accepted because there really wasn't any decision as to whether you are in agreement with those edits. And a few more edits have been made for this meeting. Um, I also reached out to Dan Larry and asked that he review the bylaw and if he had any comment to provide them now so that again if you um, are inclined to make any more edits that we just get them in in time for the public hearing to try to minimize any type of red line edits once the warrant is printed. Um, so that being said, I think it would be beneficial to just walk through the red line edits again and then if if you're inclined to just say go ahead, approve those red lines, then I'll know which ones I can make. And if we need more discussion on them and you want to listen to any of Mr. Leary's input, we can All go right. back through those after. I'd like, why don't we go through the red lines and then I'd like to, to hear from Mr. Leary. Okay. I know I spoke with him at the um, forum and I know he's got some expertise in solar, so the more information we have, the better. We can always ignore him. I mean, yep. <laughs> okay. It's happened before. <laughs> <laughs> So since the last meeting, um, well, I, I guess I'm probably going to confuse which ones we did talk about, so I'll go through them all. The scale, whether small, medium, or large, we've decreased from what the state model zoning was, and they are all identified here. And I have pulled out the pole mounted from the ground mounted. So last meeting we had a lot of discussion over how do we account for these pole mounted, where the heights of those may be higher than what we want all ground mounted systems to be. Um, so I've defined pole mounted, I've defined surface area, and the intent is the pole mounted ones like you saw in those pictures on our Academy Road, the surface area would be all the solar collectors. Um, the one that was there is approximately 400 square feet. It's a 2520 on a 10 foot high pole. There's overlapping of the pole, so the height in total is 20 feet as well. Um, okay, so that this speaks to the scale of that one. The, so, um, In section seven, the dimensional requirements. We have the roof mounted system. Um, no roof mounted system shall exceed 24 inches in height. The ground mounted, I've, we didn't decide upon a height there. So they, and the pole mounted, again, we have not decided on a height at that as well. The um, applicability section. So again, it has since been updated to include the small mounted, I'm sorry, the small scale pole mounted, medium and large scale pole mounted as well. And it actually. Can, can you look back up on the applicability section? Yep. Actually, I, let me bring this by Laura up now that you said that. So if you go number seven, ground mounted solar energy. I'm sorry, number seven under a Page two. Yeah, page two. I don't know yeah, why it's no, that's seven. one. Yeah, the page two. Uh, keep scrolling the same direction, just a little bit, right there. Yeah. I don't understand the numbering here. Yeah. It goes from six to seven. Then there's the bold face, and then it's number two, and then it's seven. So th this is a new section, section seven. Uh, right. Needs to be updated in the bylaw. Number two, we're going to add text, and number seven is a brand new, so there is six of them already in the bylaw. So the only thing we're doing is adding a number seven and modifying number two. You're not showing us one, three, I four, five, you. and six. Thank right. you. I can add those in if no, you no. prefer. I, understand I just your I there. figured it was something I was missing, and you have confirmed that. Okay. So there's three sections of the bylaw that this will amend. Yep. Thanks. Uh, definitions, the dimensional requirements, and then add section 814 for solar. Okay. Back to applicability, okay. sorry. Um, so uh, the applicability is just really defining each type, small, medium, and large, ground mounted, roof mounted, and um, pole mounted. At council's <coughs> recommendation number eight, we discussed striking at the last meeting. And so for principal use, 
I've added small scale as not a principal use. I don't see where we would ever allow that um, in any zoning district as a principal use. And small, medium, or large school scale pole mounted as a principal use, I've added to not allow those. As far as accessory uses, um, roof mounted would be allowed as of right. So when that question came up earlier today for um, 1429 Osgood Street, this draft contemplates that being allowed if he wants to do them, but at a 24 inch height on that roof. Small scale ground mounted, same thing, allowed in all districts. Small scale is up to 1,000 square feet. Small scale pole mounted as site plan review across all districts. And that was, again, discussed at last meeting, no matter where that pole initially, we probably want to look at it and then we may refine that at some future date. The medium scale um, ground mounted, now again, over 1,000 square feet. The 400 square foot one at Academy Road, there's potential that somebody may want two or three of those in their backyard. Uh, I've huh. heard in Boxford there is a lot that has three of those. Um, so in this draft, I've included special permit in the residential zones and site plan review in the business and industrial zones for that. Um, and medium and large scale pole mounted, not at all in residential and by special permit in business and industrial. Okay, and again, we're back to the dimensional requirements now within the solar section as kind of belt and suspenders. We talked about them in the dimensional section and it's here as well. And those heights will need to be established. So, gee, this is a, a dumb question, but the distinction between principal and accessory use, is that the one that's standard in the bylaw? Or is there any part of that that is unique to the situation here? So usually in the use section of any um, district, they say accessory uses for parking or different accessory uses can be allowed. Um, okay. In this, calling it out in a table, I would say that's somewhat unique. Okay. And again, the model zoning for the state does allow for that, but the... But what is considered accessory versus primary is defined in the regular bylaw. Um, yeah, so the principal use and accessory use are defined, but they're really defined as the principal use <laughs> and <laughs> accessory use. So I wouldn't say they're great definitions. No, they're circular um, definitions. I mean, yeah. it, to me, it seems like, for, at least for this, is if your business is a solar field, then it's your principal use. If it's for educational or in supplementing your house or your business or something like that, then it's accessory use. I mean, that's how, at least as a yeah. board, I would think of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so the... The state did not allow principal use for large scale, but we already have permitted Brook Solar, which is on a vacant lot. It's only a solar field, and so I consider that a principal use. I think the Osgood Landing is debatable. I mean, it, it's accessory to the building as well as a commercial use. Um, and I know there are a lot of places that are trying to limit them as pr principal uses, but I, I think it's something that if it's done in the right place that we should encourage. It's just got to be in the right place. Right. For setbacks for the pole mounted, um, so the the requirement is to install either in the side yard or rear yard, not in the front yard, and be lo no la located no closer to the street than the front building line. That's consistent with a lot of things in the bylaw. Do we define side and rear yard? So what if it's a pork chop lot? You know, what if it's it's kind of like a curve shape? Which what's your front yard? What's your side yard? Yeah. So in past cases, the building commissioner has ruled that. Yeah. Um, and what's closer to the front building line? A lot of times, the front building line is facing the side of the lot, and it's the side of the house that's actually facing the street. Um, I will say I know of at least two cases where I've gone to the building commissioner to rule on that. Okay. I, I agree that is confusing. So on solar energy systems on number 2A, we have for ground mounted to be half the setback that would otherwise apply or a minimum of 15 feet. But for pole mounted, I opted to double the requirement for pole mounted. So whatever the underlying is, double it for both side and rear setback. And again, that's just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. 
lot coverage we talked about. Um, two different options here, not include them in the calculations for lot coverage or include the non-permeable surfaces. And then, um, I think that was all the substance, but let me just scroll. So, Gene, when you, you may have said this if I totally missed the nuance, but if you have a pole mounted one and you've talked about places where you gave the example of uh, a place that had three of them. Yeah. So, when you define small, medium, and large, is it based on the aggregate or the cumulative? Does it say that anywhere? I'm, I'm just wondering. What's to prevent somebody to get around the thing of, of the small, you know, the yep. um, the threshold's less than a thousand, so I'll do three of them that are less than a thousand, therefore cumulatively, yep. even though the rover doesn't count. So the definition is an active solar energy system that occupies more than a thousand but less than 10,000 square feet of surface area. So. Uh, I think that's a good point. You, we can add aggregate in because the definition of solar energy system um, is a device structure, structural design feature or substantial purpose of which is to provide daylight from material lighting or provide for the collection, storage, and distribution of solar energy for space heating, cooling, electricity generation, or water heating. What if so, we make that feature or features or somehow indicate that it could be more than one? I'm sorry, I, I missed the beginning. So in, in that number six where you're defining solar energy yeah. system, that seems to be the place where I think you would want to... Use that word aggregate or... Yeah. yeah, or somehow indicate that it could be I agree. more than one. This is a device or structural design feature, or maybe say, or feature. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not I mean, I think it, it, it should be the cube size uh, of, of it. I wouldn't want somebody coming in here and saying, well, each pole mounted thing is right, one feature. Right, that's exactly, right. yeah, that's exactly right. what I'm worried about, yeah. <clears throat> no, I mean, the only thing I'm thinking about, what if the opposite, you know, you have really, you know, you have a multi, you know, 10 acre lot and you do five over here and five on the total opposite end, would they be considered one? We're doing the aggregate and the whole lot? Well, I think it would be, yeah, it would be the entire property. Now, you know, somebody might end up then, you know, right. breaking the lot up, but at right. some point, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, so I think aggregate's a good idea to add in there. <laughs> I agree. Um, there's just two other edits that I found today that I would like to recommend. So on 8.14.7, number two says site plan document requires to stay consistent, that should say site plan review. And the last sentence of A is not required. I would like to strike that. Approval granted under this section shall satisfy the requirements of 8.3 site plan review. For the most part, 8.3 has been brought into here and we're doing either site plan review or special permit. Um, so I would recommend striking that language. Um, so, Gene, just going back to the aggregate, if you could, I think, I, I agree with Jen, if you could put it in before, in six, before you get to the A through, okay, yep. just, you know, solar energy system shall include the aggregate of all, yep. you know, systems on the parcel, something along those lines, would be great. Yep. Okay. Um, so, why don't, is that it, is that all our changes? Yep. Okay, so why don't we hear from Mr. Leary and then we can ask questions and then we can have a discussion. Welcome. Hello. Welcome back. Dan Leary, 26 Andover Street. Hello, good evening. Um, different topic, again. Let's, let's talk lighting. <laughs> um, so thank you, um, Jean, for uh, approaching me last week and saying, hey, what are your thoughts on the bio? I've been tracking it uh, a bit and uh, love to help um, guide it if I can uh, for what it's worth and please ask me any questions you have. But um, going through it, I, my first response to it is it's a really, really good thing that we're putting together a bylaw for the town that covers this because it would have saved a lot of um, time and expense. I know at least on the, 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 the earlier project we did because this seems to define things a lot better. 
Um, I think it uh, is very good that we're using the state's model bylaw. I encourage us, if anything, to um, re retract some things back to what the state encourages. In fact, if you haven't read the um, narrative that's in the state model bylaw, it's worth reading all of that because they talk about uh, a lot of experiences. They, it, reading through it, I first read this early on, I think it was 2008 when they first started publishing it, and um, there's a lot of lessons learned in that narrative uh, from different communities. Uh, so it's worth looking at that. Um, the, I guess the second major comment before I get into a couple of the details of things I saw is uh, I look at this like, okay, you have businesses and you have uh, homeowners that want to use solar energy to, um, to supplement their lives or their business and, and that's great. And then you have this other category of uh, now there's developers and land and, and people that go out that are in the power plant business. And that's probably, to me, that's a good way of looking at the whole landscape. There's kind of these two categories. And I think that um, as I've worked in a lot of towns around New England, um, some towns are much more embracing of, of people that want to do power plants. And I think every town, including North Andover, should be very embracing of the, 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 the homeowners and the businesses that want to elect to incorporate uh, solar energy into their lifestyle or into their business. Uh, and I'll, I'll just give you an, a really good example of something I had absolutely no part of, but to me it's a great, a great thing we should strive for. Snyder Electric, I don't know if you've seen the, the Snyder Electric headquarters in, in Andover, is, if anybody's been to it. Um, so you, you drive into their to their industrial park, and uh, right in front of the building are uh, solar-powered carports with electric vehicles parked underneath them that uh, a, a big chunk of their uh, employees use. And you walk into what I think is one of the most modern and uh, incredible uh, headquarters uh, of, of that I've seen. It's a great example of um, what I envision to be the future of uh, the type of businesses that I want to attract here or attract back to here in that case. Um, so it, it's a very, very good thing. Uh, the only problem um, is that that structure, that solar project that they have there um, that's so important to the building couldn't be built without a ton of waivers in, in this bylaw. So I, I think that's just one thing to, to think about. Um, if if uh, Jeff Bezos had said, yes, it's going to be North Andover, um, he would want to be putting solar carports right in front of that building or whatever building becomes there. It would be on the street. So I, I think it's uh, important to recognize sort of how industry and the commercial use of solar uh, is evolving. Uh, solar is not a four-letter word, uh, hopefully anymore. So enough on that. So a couple of... Um, I think I have five or six maybe specific things that I, I really think should be addressed before it, it goes to print. Um, so obviously the height of ground, with respect to ground mounts, um, the height of them uh, I think has not been specified yet. I actually don't think it was even specified in the, the general, in the um, model bylaw. Um, I think you were considering 10 feet. I'd encourage us to consider 15. Um, the reason for that is because right now carports are not defined in in the bylaw, and I I don't know where, if anywhere, they're going to be used in North Andover, but carports are going to be taller than 10 feet. Um, second is the um, Department of Energy Resources. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about putting it on top of a carport, a solar panel on top of a carport? Our Oh, I no, wish but sorry. Yeah. Okay. I wish I, I should have brought pictures. Um, I mean, I've seen like where electric cars plug in, but like that's in a garage, so I'm not really sure. If if so, if if you imagine a parking lot um, with with an overhang, mm -hmm. um, where it's it's generally minimum of 11 foot six, I think. So call it 12 feet is the lowest point. I'm trying to picture. Highest part might be. Um, it, it's it's worth driving through Schneider Electric's. Uh, uh, if you have a chance, it's just over and and over. But that's an example. That's probably the nearest example of a carport. And yes, I do think those are going to be installed in North Andover in my lifetime. But so I I hopefully we would can. that be ground mounted. I wouldn't actually. I thought that it's like that's more roof mounted. Right. So again, that. So a separate structure. Right. Or that's a separate structure with it on a roof. So I'm, I'm not sure that. I mean. Do you have it, Peter? Um, are those pole uh, mounted? Yeah, that's. Yeah, to make it worse, they're on poles sometimes. Yes. 
Yeah. Right. So maybe yeah. so. It's, it's not really See, see, I'm not sure that I'm not sure if those are any of the. I, I, maybe that's pole mounted. It's not. I don't. I wouldn't consider that ground mounted. I maybe I would consider roof mounted. I think it's a structure. It, its own structure. I would I mean, consider it its own structure. We actually had this debate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The debate uh, was, that's a structure. So the the Osgood Landing proposal initially was carports on the sides of their building, um, to that that type of design. So how would that? Would this bylaw even talk about that? Structures that are on their own structures? And my I mean, take, and, and we talked about this just this morning, I didn't talk to the building commissioner, but my recollection was that was considered a structure with a roof mounted that's, solar. That's how I, I would consider that it a structure with a roof mounted. And so person. roof mounted in this proposal right. is allowed by right, right in all districts. Would you want to add that in? Yeah, but the, the thing, that's interesting because I was okay with it until it reached that point because the problem ends up being is you put something on a roof, there's an element of scale to the primary use, but this is a, arguably, an ex no, it's, it's, it's really, is it a, an accessory use? It depends on if you put it, if you're putting it in your house, then yes. No, but in a commercial uh, facility. Depends on how big the commercial. I mean, if you I have mean, a, because the problem is then you get different yeah, I scale. So. I mean, you, you know, you you get a structure that's arguably could be as big as the entire structure of the building. But, but I would think if if it was solar roof mounted by right, the structures themselves still could trigger site plan review because right. they could change traffic circulation, they could storm water. So there's other yeah. components. Yeah, I, mean, that I think anything that big is going to be reviewed under some right. aspect. Like to me, that's you're building a garage and putting a solar panel on it. It just happened to be built yeah. together. Okay, so interesting. So if it's considered a ground mount, consider the height, I guess, would be my comment. But I, I, I agree, it's something different that you should address somehow. But the main reason is because I, otherwise, I think you're coming in and talking to the building inspector and, and asking for their opinion of what it is, which. So, we can so clarify we could define now. them as a carport structure, and define yeah, I mean, that just like be, we did pull mount. Yeah, you could um, you could create a separate category. The problem with that is if that thing evolves over time to what right. it's meant to be, that may not be the way to go. It's or, hard because I think we do want to be as specific as we can, but some but we also want to be flexible. See, like I don't is a car a carport in your house versus a giant one at a built. I yeah. just don't know what's going to come, so I don't know if we want to limit ourselves there I don't know so that's a that's a good point I, I don't know I if we have an that. answer <laughs> no I agree with that I, I think there's a lot of technology I don't think it's ground mounted though yeah um, the the second thing on the height of ground mounted is that the state now is um, because of a, a lot of agriculture land was approached for for large-scale okay. solar um, the state's um, taken an approach that they want agriculture to continue underneath ground mount so right now they're encouraging uh, for agriculture uh, minimum of eight foot um, height that's to the lowest part of the array so that agriculture um, can still happen ag agricultural activity can still happen underneath the solar panels um, whether it's livestock or crops um, so ten, you know 10 foot would cut it. no I, I don't see them that, going over 15 feet you're effectively, uh, the so only way you're going to get in, it, 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 it basically it's a clearance of eight feet, is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So everything's going to be higher than eight feet. So Plus you're going to have to put it in a pole. Right. So the issue well, is that the state regulations don't, and, and most regulations that I've seen don't distinguish between ground mounted and pole mounted. If it's not on the roof, it's on the ground. I mean, that's basically what. Yeah, that's on. what I mean. That's. I, I, I like. Guess, the, I like the distinction. Yeah, I think it's a good distinction because I'm thinking of. Uh, ground mounted is on the ground and how far up it goes from the ground. I mean, that's just sort of, you know, whereas... And and they have footing, so there's several right. footings to hold yeah. that collector array in. Can you just put it in perspective? So what is the height, the max height of the ground mounted at Osgood Landing versus a regular residential type install? So the Osgood Landing, what did they end up, 18 inches off? Oh yeah, that's, that's Osgood Landing is a, is a rooftop system. A flat roof system that we just put down on asphalt, so that's not a probably good. So a, an example. Um, so a, a very a, a standard 
ground-mounted solar array. The bottom of the array is about three feet off the ground. Um, that's for snow clearance. Uh, that's pretty typical. And the top is generally anywhere from 8 to 12 feet. Um, typically, they follow the terrain. The state discourages massive grading to flatten land or anything like that, remove topsoil. So they, um, they, they follow the contours of, of the land. That's, that's a typical, I'll call it a solar farm. But, but, but like on, uh, on Michael's property, how far, they're not that high, are they? No, the, that, that's, the, those are about six feet off the ground, five, six feet off the are? ground. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, I, that's, that's not the most current um, No, I, I, and I realize yeah. that, but I'm just thinking. The, you know, so uh, one, one of the reasons. Like three or four feet, actually, to make from where, yeah, yeah but. One of the reasons for optimizing to larger, um, to, to taller ones versus smaller ones is to minimize the amount of uh, footings and concrete pilings that you have to put into the ground so there's a land disturbance factor. There, by there, there's an optimization exercise you can go through to see what, you know. Um, another example of a ground mount, which is not typically done, is what like what's over at the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District, um, where those are, you know, three three feet tall. At their highest, but t typically they are they they do tend to be taller. Um, so. In your experience, is this something that setting a maximum height limit might sort of set us up for trouble as technology is developing, like we're going to be bumping up against it, or is that, I mean, is it not best practices to set a height requirement? Because I think when I think about the height requirement that's baked in here, what I'm thinking about is the neighbor that puts a giant solar thing in their backyard that is, like, all of the neighbors like that is a monstrosity. Mm -hmm. What did you just do to my backyard? It might be, you know, like, that's what I and more concerned with yeah that like that porch I mean, whatever that belmont land where there was the pork chop lawn and they like these people put these mm -hmm. this giant pole mounted array basically in somebody's front yard i want to make sure that we're in a position that we are encouraging solar at every opportunity but not putting neighbors in a bad position right yes exactly i i don't I don't think people need to put 15 foot tall solar arrays like in their backyard because I think there's ways to make it more. I mean, if they do, that's that's fine. It's but but they. I'm talking about the commercial, you know, commercial solar farms will tend to be larger. I don't see this as having a lot of space for that in North Andover. That's not going to be very common. I think carports could be more common. Well, I think for our. I mean, I think we do it just in if our medium large scale ground mounted or pole mounted. In business, commercial, and industrial, we do it by special permit. So, um, I, I think I think I agree. I, I would love to see them, you know, in in. I'd love to see businesses I, using them either as an as an accessory use. So, are you saying more as a primary or principal use? I I just don't know why if it makes a whole lot of sense to put a height limitation on something that's not residential, or if it is, make it 15 feet or something reasonable because that I think that's the normal standard. Not 15 feet, but well, we 12 were, feet, certainly. What would you say would be, I mean, if you were designing this, what would you say would be a reasonable height restriction for residential? I mean, just in, in terms of what people typically do, what you're seeing, and... Um, I don't always put you on the spot, but... I'm no, just, that, that's a great question. I, I, when I put them in my backyard, I, I put them down low at three feet. Um, I grow pumpkins underneath mine. I, I, I'm, I would put it a couple feet higher and grow some other, you know, strawberries underneath it. Might do very well. But um, I, don't, I don't know if it's eight feet. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think like a, a basketball hoop, right? I and mean, people have basketball hoops in their backyard, and, and just because we're used to seeing them, but that's 12 feet high, you know? And the rim is 10, and then probably another two feet. I mean, that's kind of what I'm envisioning. It, that seems okay to me. Anything, but it, but but then if we have 400 feet across, then it, it gets you know, then then it gets a little dicey. But that's kind of, in terms of height, I, that's kind of where I see. It. So this is for the pole. Yes. Yeah. 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 For the pole. That's that's interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I personally don't see. Uh, the advantage of doing a pole mark mounted, I probably disagree in this respect because to, to me it's it's an issue of looking across a property and seeing a, a wall of solar panels, whether they were mounted on poles 
or a typical like like when I think when we say pole, I think we mean like a monopole. Like there's one pole coming out of the ground and then a big wall of panels that is most typically installed as a big wall of panels. We have several struts coming out of the ground to hold it up. The reason for the monopole is because it, it tilts on axes, fault tracks the sun. Um, I, I, I would just say, you know, I think I would think that a, a height, uh, max height on a residential, whether it was any type of ground mount, is probably the thing that gives us the, the town, you know, the, the best protection. Um, I, but I, I just don't see the the benefit of doing calling out poles specifically in this case, yeah. unless, but maybe I'm not thinking of it the right way. I think the, the theory was that they, those might actually be higher than some of the ground ones, and they were kind of a different because they do rotate and stuff like that, and we wanted to be a little more uh, protective there. Even if mm -hmm. the heights, um, even if the height is allowed is higher, we still, by, you know, to, by either site plan or special permit, be a little more restrictive. There. So I think that's why we called them out. Not necessarily, not really the height issue. It was more the um, special permit site plan issue. Okay. The um, then just a couple other things um, on on the rooftop, the 24 inches. I, I think that doesn't make any sense to me because I, I think there are going to be some technology. Well, most flat roof mounted systems, like Gene said, are 12, 14 inches off the top of the roof. They have to be low for wind loading. Um, there are other technologies, for example, uh, solar hot water collectors. Um, we've built a number of like pool heating systems, commercial kitchen systems where you have a six foot collector that'll sit, you know, at an angle probably six feet high, five feet tall on brackets on top of a roof. And that falls into the definition of solar energy systems in the bylaw. So I, I just, you know, they're typically not massive arrays. They'll sit in the middle of a, of a building, but I, I don't think you'd want to not allow those because it's it's higher than 24 inches. Um, so my thought process on the 24 inches was the concern that you had tonight. How high would they be? Again, with the previous Osgood landing, um, the board seemed to be um, in favor <coughs> of not seeing them from a property line, which at Osgood landing is pretty far away from the building, and having a parapet and just the visual um, impact of these when you have the entire flat roof covered. So the 24 inches was just, I know it was much higher than what they did at Osgood Landing, um, but but this this yeah, type of and use and is. It feels like what you're talking about, Dan, is, is something that is structurally a lot different. I mean, I, I'm trying to envision even what it looks like. Can you give an example of one of those things, like you said, that is like a water collector? So what does it look like? Yeah, so it's uh, so if imagine the sheet of paper six or seven feet tall, um, sitting on top of a flat roof. It, it might you might have like six or eight of these um, would be hot water hot water supply for like a commercial kitchen. Um, done a bunch of that type of work, so you know this this could be six feet off the ground. It's not um, it's not like it covers an entire large roof. You wouldn't see that. It, you, you also t find this type, type of technology being developed for um, uh, like a, uh, cooling systems, uh, absorption chilling for mechanical systems. So if you have a rooftop unit up on your roof that sits four or five feet tall, um, you might find collectors around it that are actually creating hot water for absorption chilling um, for, for those units. So there's other technologies that are solar related that are kind of mechanically related to it okay but again I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure things are in proportion and then to scale mm -hmm. and it seemed to me that at some point you could have if you had something that was seven eight feet tall and 40 feet long on top of a roof someplace I'm not sure most people would like that if it were visible so that's that's the point. I don't know that they wouldn't <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I could get you some photographs of, I mean, where, where I've seen it often is, um, yeah, we did a couple schools, 
um, like that where we put put them up on top of a school is commercial this these aren't really residential systems but you know it's technology that's been used for decades can, can I ask um, just a, on principal uses we don't know we're not we're saying no to the small medium large scale pole mounted solar everywhere yeah. and we might have talked about this why not allow those by special permit in um, industrial and commercial because just if the technology is going towards the rotating the sun and I'm thinking of like a you know Oscar landing or, or some other you know large parcel if they wanted to put a solar field that was moving things around and nobody could see it you know why not by special permit just I don't know if anyone had any thoughts about no, that no I agree I agree I, the more yeah, that you're sharing your knowledge of this with me the more I'm feeling like and maybe this is others feel differently but the more I'm feeling like to the extent that we're going to put height restrictions in on things to me it makes sense it may make more sense to do it as a height limitation in residential zones but then just leave it up for a special permit in sort of the business and commercial and industrial districts so that we can have the opportunity to review each project because the the applications and the, the things that you're talking about here are things that I have no familiarity with and wouldn't unless it came before me but all seem like things that if it was done correctly would be something that we as a town would want to encourage um, yeah, or, or you could even go heights higher could be subject to special permits. Yeah, but you're right. Or waivers. Uh, I, mean, you know, I, mean, I mean, waivers. I mean, you could make it all a special permit yeah. and have, have waivers for uh, Yeah, with waivers. I mean, yeah, it, it, the point is we don't want to make it too prescriptive, but we want to have sufficient control. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess the more Dan is talking, the more I'm realizing how much I don't know. And so it makes me nervous to put limitations on a technology like this that could be really beneficial for our environment, for our town, for businesses, when I just don't know what I'm doing, right? And, and I, I see a definite benefit to these height limitations in residential districts, but uh, the more Dan is talking, the more I'm unsure about what would make sense in a commercial or industrial but district. But where it would be interesting is like what we just <laughs> talked about earlier tonight, where residential is right next to the right. commercial district. That's going to be the hard one. But if you have it subject to special permit, then you can. Well, right. Then you can ensure that it's it's proportional. It makes sense. It's not having. Do we have a um, uh, like a horatory section in the beginning that we're doing this to, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, to minimize the visual impacts and there's a purpose section 8.14.1 yeah <clears throat> oh yeah purpose yeah okay so, yeah. the the model bylaw has a really good uh, paragraph on that um, discussing I think what our lessons learned from towns on regulation of aesthetics and what you can do for life safety and um, health and welfare and you know how, how to approach that type of thing um, it, it's it, it is a good read for what it's worth yeah you know now that I'm focusing on this I'd almost uh, I mean maybe it's just me but promote regulate and restrict the creation I think you know we want to encourage the use of solar in the town but Right. So, but the, the the problem is by creating a bylaw, we're actually not encouraging it because yeah. right now you can do it with that. You can just do it. There is no real regulation. So, if we're actually res we are restricting what is currently available, but I think what we're doing it is to protect neighborhoods while still allowing for solar. So, um, mm -hmm. which I, I, so I think that the it's in the right place. But that is the actual purpose is to restrict the, of the bylaw itself. Or to codify more, I don't know. <clears throat> so I, I think I understand what you're saying, but I would probably just look at it a little different. That the, the point of the bylaw here, if it's well crafted, is to focus the development of solar. I, I wouldn't say it's restricting it. It's it's in, encouraging it in these areas, in these forms. So, yes, yes. I'm just saying. It's just maybe yeah. semantics. But no, no, yeah. My point is, it's more restrictive than what we have now. 
anything we do is more restrictive than what we have now. So, but but you're right. It could be to well, I think encourage the, the these effect of it could revenue. be, hey, here's the guidelines, here's the lanes, you're in these lanes, come on down. So it's we're encouraging the, you know, the. But I don't want smart our, way of no no but no but you're right. We could yeah. make to encourage rather than to restrict or encourage the encouraging them to adopt solar in the way we want them to. Right. No well, the whole idea is the encourage. Was was intended. Yeah. 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 No, I know. Encourage it in ways that have minimal impact on others. Yeah. Right. So it's trying to strike that balance. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I keep coming back to the height thing, which was such an open question so, in my head before. So anyway. as a follow up to that, you've indicated we should do it by special permit, but there's a lot of cases where a special permit's not required in business and yeah. industrial, it's site plan review only. But you could get a, but you could get a, if you were gonna go 36 inches, you could get a um, variance from the, potentially, right? A waiver, right? You, well, potentially. you provide for a waiver under your Well, we could either provide for a waiver, but if we didn't yep. have a waiver process, you'd go to the, you could theoretically Go, go to the ZBA and say based on your topography or whatever, you know. Uh, I'm not sure that I want to push it to their yeah, jurisdiction. I'm not sure I, yeah, I, but, I, I, but I mean, to the extent you could put the things in and wave them out, or. Do we have good waiver language in another a bylaw? For waiver. Um, Is there one in here? Yep, towards oh. the end. Well, any of the submittal and design requirements that doesn't matter. So. so you'd have to add dimensional requirements, right? Yes. So I think we'd, we'd have to add something about waiving the height requirements. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think you could say dimensional and, and yeah. that so would include I think you could remove waive dimensional and dimensional <laughs> requirements if in the if in the public interest and in you know not having a deleterious effect on you know a butter or neighbor neighborhood things like that i'm not sure if we have good waiver language somewhere else that would could steal from but so i, th I think that would help us out if we did put the limits yeah i mean it, I don't think about that a little bit. It's, if if you can waive anything, then you're likely over time to waive anything. And uh, do you really want to do that? I well, mean, but that, I guess that, I, you're right. But the Jen's point is, we don't know. We don't know. And I was talking about the idea is, could you put limits in, but then say that you automatically jump to maybe it being a special permit if you exceed those limits. But that, that may be too complicated, too. Uh, so. Okay. No, but that's a, that could be a good compromise if you want to. Uh, Do we need to decide this today? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Take your silence as a yes. <laughs> um. Um, I mean, I think what we're going to probably have to do is put something in, but we're going to end up editing it. You know, because uh, it feels to me it's not right yet. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, okay. So you had, did you have other points? I, I just had a few more. I'll go faster. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the next one is on um, on size. So this is one area where the our town's bylaw deviates from the um, the model zoning bylaw, uh, model solar bylaw. And I think, I think I get it. So the um, what was like for small scale for homeowners was 1,750 feet, I believe, yeah. of um, what I think was intended to be sort of ground surface area. Um, we made a thousand feet, but made it the actual collector area. So the physical size of the solar panels themselves. That's that's how we did it. So that that one is somewhat analogous. Um, Thousand could probably be twelve hundred, but it's maybe close enough. 
but when we get into the midsize, um, that's where it, it really changes. Uh, I think it went from 40 down to 10. Yeah, 40 down to 10. Um, and that's, that's kind of relevant because a small commercial uh, business that wants to put up a 10 kilowatt solar, so like the one at, at Small Axe is 10 kilowatts, just to give it a, a scale. Um, I, I think that was the intent of that. I mean, to, to go through um, site plan review, um, which again is very, very good. It has a lot of detail in it, but there comes a point where a, 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 it's just maybe kicking, kicking into a, a full special permit for, for something that small doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. I, I can see that discouraging solar. If, if that was not in our intent, we should really look at those sizes again. Well, it's only special permit in uh, residential. It's site plan and business and commercial on, mm -hmm. under the medium. So I think we were just trying to be extra cautious with residential. And, and maybe a lot of it, it's going to depend on how many applications we get, right? If we're getting you know, 20, 30 site plan reviews, and yeah, maybe that for, you know, 10,000 or more, then maybe that's too much and we have to tweak the numbers, but I think we were trying to be very sensitive to um, neighbors while still encouraging solar. That's why we, mm -hmm. the numbers, 40,000 square feet just seems like a lot. Yeah, so 40,000 40, square feet is, um, I think that's like a 60 kilowatt system, so that's the size of a small commercial um, system. It's not I don't know. It's just hard, hard to envision, envision that um, uh, 10,000 10, square feet triggering, is it, was it 10,000 square feet that triggers a, um, a special permit? Um, only in um, residential. Only in residential for medium scale. Yeah. Ten, if you get, so if you're 10,000 square feet, then if you're in a residential, you'll need a special permit. You can still mm -hmm. do it, special permit. Um, I'm sorry. So. I just got confused. <laughs> okay, so well, the in reading, comparing the the, the model solar bylaw to this, um, that is a general comment. I'll leave. I can come back with more specifics, but um, we we do change that dramatically. Um, so that would seem to discourage um, the the development of solar to some degree. And I can tell you if that's material or not. But mm -hmm. um, but on the commercial side only. Yeah, on the commercial side, yeah. That's... Yeah. Well, again, I mean, I think, though, to Ann's point is that the hurdle you have to climb is a relatively modest hurdle because it's only site plan review. And chances are, if you're doing something like this, you're going to have site plan review for some other sort of thing anyway. So you're, you're really not being subject to an enormous regulatory burden. It isn't... The um, site plan review requirements, they look pretty close to the special permit requirements. No, but it's, but it's different. It's because under special site plan review, if you basically have a reasonable plan, with the planning board can't just deny it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a, in a site plan, you can deny it if you think it will have a deleterious effect. In the special permit. So the mm -hmm. special permit in yep. here needs to comply with the special permit 10.31 in our bylaw for all special permits. With site plan review, they, that finding doesn't need to be made. But as I read this, and maybe I'm wrong, they need a special permit for a medium scale ground mounted or pole mounted. So what Dan is saying is that if we're at like 1,000 feet for a commercial thing, they're going to need a special permit if it's ground mounted? No, SPR, yeah. site plan review. No, the bottom line. The bottom one. That's, that's for ground-mounted or pole-mounted solar energy. Medium or large-scale ground-mounted needs special permit. Medium or large-scale yeah. ground-mounted. Yeah, no, something's wrong there, though. I, that should be just, no, because medium-scale ground-mounted right. above that. I, Some, yeah, that, that's a mistake. That must be. Right, it. so large-scale ground-mounted or pole-mounted. That must pole be medium pole-mounted or large-scale ground-mounted. Yes, you're right. Yeah. I, okay. So yeah, that, yeah, okay, that, a typo. I'll, I'll have to reread that again. I, I think there might also be a mistake up in the um, on page five up in above that for large scale ground mounted solar energy systems as a um, primary use. I think where it says SPR, you meant to put SP. 
for industrial and no no it's just site plan i think Th those are just site plan i think For the large scale ground mode to solar energy on the primary use? Is that the one you're thinking? For primary use? Okay. Yeah, I guess it probably would make sense. I mean, I, I mean, if we're going to make it a special so, permit for for an accessory use, it probably want, if you're going to make it your primary use, we probably want to make it a special permit too. I, I don't, I just, so like at the Brook School project, yeah. is that? Yeah, that was in well, a residential got a special, zone, so it was by special permit. And it's and okay. a lot of disturbance permit yeah. too, right? But, I, but we may want to be consistent there if we're going to make it as an accessory use. If you're only, you might, it seems a little, that. The, the, the model zoning bylaw calls most of these site plan review, so that may, I don't know, it's just, just worth looking over them again. Um, last couple comments. Um, the bond, the, the financial guarantees at, at the end of this for a, um, large scale project. I think that's excessive. I, I, where I see bonds being asked for projects is like on municipal projects where you're building on a land or building on a, a landfill or a municipal landfill. Um, that's typically where I'd see a deconstruction bond. Um, if somebody wanted to put up a I'm sorry, what's the threshold again for the large scale? Is it 10,000 square feet? If somebody wants to put up a 10,000 square foot um, solar project on a, on a farm somewhere, we're going to ask them, is the town going to ask them for a deconstruction bond that they're going to hold for 20, 25 years? Yeah, I would think so. Actually, yes. I, I mean, just because I, mean, I don't know as much probably as you do about what's in the, in, in the solar arrays or the materials and stuff like that but my guess is after 15 20 years you may not be able to scrap those you may not be I, i'm not sure what type of materials there are in them whether it's hazardous or not but um, i think having something to be able to deconstruct those is actually pretty important because how, yeah. how much are you going to charge for that yeah i'm not sure I, uh, yeah it's more bond yeah shorty bond, bond is it right. uh, So a 10,000 square foot solar array is, I, I just, in my experience, I, I don't think you can get those bonds for, you know, for, for something small. I, I just see that as being a real, uh, a real problem for, for, for most people trying to, trying to do projects. Um, Model bylaw that the state has have any kind of decommissioning uh, bond uh, requirement. I, so. I can look at that. That language primarily came from Beverly's, but I thought Beverly's was better. Um, but I believe it does. I know that's been a big concern of municipalities. It may not be a, a, the state, but I know towns have been concerned about that. Yeah, when we've done municipal projects, they'll 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 want to see that on municipal land. Um, but for for you know, I just, I can't see somebody that wants to do this on their land in town um, putting up a, a, a decommissioning bond. Um, but, okay. so I think that's, I'm sorry. And then uh, just, for, it, this, this may be a silly thing in, in, along the lines of waiver, but really small poles. I built, a, 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 there's a few in town um, where it's just a solar hot water system sitting on a, a monopole in the ground and uh, it's not bothering anybody. But this, it just shouldn't require a site plan review or a special, I mean, it's, it's an appliance sitting in somebody's backyard. Um, I, I could give you some examples of those. Uh, it's- well, On Academy it's, Road, maybe he thought he had an appliance there too. I mean, you know, some of that's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Some point, there's a de minimis sort of thing, but that'll be almost self-perpetuating because people who are going to do that just won't even go and get building permits. The, yeah, no, they're. I mean, as far as I know, everybody's getting the building permits for those. I, I just there there's some that are so small. I mean, they're, they're, you, you wouldn't even know they're there. 
Um, I, it's just I, I can't imagine coming in and I mean, it's like if, if there, there's fences you can put up that don't require you even have a building permit. I mean, these you get a building permit for, but it, it's just hard to fathom that this, this could be a problem for anyone. Uh, I, it, there's some examples around town you could look at. But, that, I just but how would that. you suggest delineating those? That's the hard part, right? I, I, Other than I, you know it when you somebody see it. comes in for a building permit, and the building inspector is going to say, "All right, you're going to you want to put a solar collector on the ground." Um, well, if it's ground mounted, then that would be as of right. So then that wouldn't require anything. So he he would say, "Don't computer. put it on a pole. Put it on the." Put it on four legs, not on one. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Aaron, so, the model bylaw does call for abandonment and decommissioning. Um, it doesn't call for the financial security, but Beverly and Haverhill, I just looked at quick, and both of them do require financial What's support. the minimum size on that, though? On, on the, that triggers the... Well, in here it says yeah. the well, large scale. No, I know in ours, okay. but but our numbers are different, right? And my concern in all of this is that I think solar is important to be encouraged in our town in a smart way. And if what we're hearing is that the restrictions that we're putting in place to try to do this in a smart way is going to actually deter people from adopting solar, then that concerns me. I don't want to be a part of a bylaw that is going to make people say, gee, I was going to convert to solar, but North Andover makes it impossible. It's not worth my time or cost. Like, you know, I, there has to be a middle road. And if our moving the line in terms of what's medium, large scale for commercial projects it impacts that, then I think it's something that we need to keep considering because I'm not comfortable with that line. And so what I, my concern is, Dan has said, the the bond issue may deter some businesses. Now we know that other, the model and other towns have bond requirements or something similar, decommissioning but, things, but what, what are the sizes that they're requiring it? Is it at the 10,000 that we're at or are they at like 50,000, 60,000? Because that, that's an important but, but, factor. But in it. See, I think the bond issue is less of an issue than I, I would disagree because I think if you uh, you get a surety bond for that disposal, the, the cost is really pretty small. And I agree there probably should be a minimum threshold for for that, but I think it will be a reasonable sized commercial project that will have sufficient return on investment that it shouldn't be hard to do. And to be affordable, so, well, I, don't, why don't I don't we, believe it will be engaging. Why don't we do some research? Why don't we see yeah. if we can find out what the costs are? Yeah. I, I'd love to know who can get them and what the costs are. Because I've yeah. I've had an impossible time trying to get those for for these projects. You know, and I'm also John thinking I, not. I think it's it's. I'm sorry. Big scale commercial businesses, but I'm thinking of my my husband's small family business, and I know that he has been considering using solar at some points, but he's got a very small building. He's got a very small lot of land. It's not in North Andover, but if he were facing all of these requirements and needed to go in through a special permit and all of these things because he's at 11 or 12,000 square feet. And that, that's a trigger spot for smaller businesses. I just don't know that I'm comfortable putting in so many impediments. And this is just one of them. I agree it's probably not the most important. I think the where they fall on the scale of what type of review they need is probably more important. But I, I do think that it there's a middle ground between residential, large-scale commercial. I, I just think we need to be aware of all of that and all of the repercussions. And I think Dan's brought up some good points that we ought to consider. So in Haverhill, I mean, it, every town is that different, I, I will say. But yeah. in Haverhill, the large-scale ground-mounted installations are allowed only in residential districts. Such installations require a special permit and site plan. Ground-mounted solar installations, regardless of size, shall not be allowed in any commercial, industrial, or waterfront zoning district. So they, they wanted the businesses in their business zones and not yeah. these. So yeah. I saw just... It's all over the place. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be. That's pretty. That's kind of weird. Actually. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, unusual. Yeah, I mean, I talked I mean, to the planner in Beverly. They're going to pretty much be special permits everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what's the size limit on large scale large in scale Beverly Haverhill. or in Haverhill? I'm just curious. Yep, large scale ground mounted, um, a solar energy system that is structurally mounted on the ground and is not roof mounted and has a minimum nameplate capacity greater than 250 kilowatt. So you were talking 60 or 10,000. 
and occupies more than five acres of land. So, if I remember right, Brooks was five acres. Mm -hmm. I forget how many yours was, but it was significantly more than that. So that's much bigger than what we have as our minimum, is that right, Dan? Osgood Landing is much yeah. bigger than five acres. I believe Brooks was approximately five acres. Fifth, yeah, 15, 15 acres or something. Yeah, I, just, I, I can't do the translation between <laughs> uh, the amount of energy and what the size is. <laughs> I'm like yeah, looking in square feet. But. Like I, I think Man, uh, Man Orchards up, up in Methuen, they're, they're, yeah. they're a good example of the, the issue I have with this. Like, So here you have a farm that put up, I think it's 100 or 80 or 100 kilowatt array. So that would fall into large scale in our bylaw. Um, and that would require a bond. Like, can you see approaching the the, 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 the farm owner and, and saying you got to put up a, a bond for 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 this? It, see, actually, I don't. On, I, the, on the other, other hand, I, sorry, I was just saying that one. I don't have a problem with it at all. Actually, and to me, I mean, they're right in a commercial district. I think it's a great use of the space, and I think it looks actually yeah. it looks really good. But you know, that's just another day at the uh, ice cream yeah. stand. Um, developers, on the other hand. About putting up solar farms, that probably is. The, if you right. do have to do a decommissioning bond, one they're very large; they're generally two megawatts plus. That's where it kind of makes sense if, if you're going to do it. But thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. So I, I mean, I, I I think the can we make even further distinctions between residential and commercial is a good um, consideration to kind of keep going through. So. I guess the question is, what do we want to do today? I, I mean, I, mean, I, I, well, I think I think we raised a lot of good points tonight. Yeah. <laughs> it's got everybody thinking a lot. The problem is, I, I feel at this point we're going to have to put a placeholder in because there's no way we're going to be able to go through it tonight and uh, really make something. You know, if we if we make decisions, we'll make decisions badly. Um, I, I'm thinking maybe. Can you leave, can you when you put something in? Can you put it in with blanks on anything, or do you have to actually uh, put it like a number in? So at this point, the legal notice requires it to be available to be reviewed at the planning department and the clerk's office. So what I keep is where we're at. So this draft is there now. Um, as far as submitting it for the warrant, I just I don't know the timetable for the selectman to open and close the warrant. I just know the conversations I had is no, but can we put it as you know height XXX? Yeah. Instead of naming a height, okay. knowing that we're going to have to change it, yeah. we'll have to make a motion. I, I don't, I don't see why we couldn't. I don't see why we couldn't. No. So I mean, I think that would be the better thing yeah. to do right now is you know leave a placeholder for that and then. At our next meeting, we finalize. I thought you meant a placeholder for the whole article. No, no, I think so. I think like I think the like selectmen need to see. Leave it as leave it as is. Yep. With and anywhere that we've had these dimensional discussions, maybe you know let's or let's just leave it as is with the XX feet and things like that, um, and then we'll all look at it and have further discussions. Um, and I mean, I'll try to do some research on the bond issue. I think it's a good point, and whether it applies to residential, whether it applies to just commercial sizes and things like that, we can have further discussion about. Okay. Do you want me to accept any of the red line edits? So the size differences that were made, add language for cumulative or aggregate, or shall include the aggregate of all systems under number six. I mean, I would, I would be in favor of just making all the red line edits. As you will have them right now, we can always change them. Okay, and then, yeah. but with X's, even yeah, the 24 with, inch, yeah. I'm going to change the 24 to an X as well. Um, the roof mounted height. Yeah, that's fine. And then, let me look at this real quick. Um, as far as lock coverage, do you have any preference? I think it's okay not to include it in the calculation. Be honest. The only time we include lot coverage is for the business zones, really, industrial business, residentials. We don't have a lot coverage. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit different than a building because it's not going to be as tall as a building. As right. long as you, I think you're okay if you have the setbacks uh, right. all in line because there's going to be other. You know, you can't go by wetlands or anything like that anyway. Right. So I, I don't think lot coverage is a big deal here. I, yeah, I, I agree. I would be in favor of not being included in law okay. coverage. Okay. 
it. I think that was it. Okay. And so I'm not going to change anything in the primary or accessory use designation for site plan versus special permit. I not yet. We can continue okay. to talk about them. I do want to you know, kind of look at those, but let's keep it for now. And again, I'll, I'll confirm the submission deadlines. And if by chance it doesn't need to be done, then that's, I'll get back to you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, so, and although there's model zoning, I will say that everybody deviated from that to a degree, yeah. and it just came down to preference. And then, so minutes. Motion uh, to approve March 6th minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. And anybody got anything else? Announcements? Anything like that? Um, town election, March 27th. That's before we come back, right? All right, so go out there and vote. Early enough. <laughs> uh, Early but not often. <laughs> yeah. Get just one. Uh, Hold your calendar for uh, Earth Day cleanup, uh, yeah. town, and the lake. Yeah. Assuming the ice is out, right? Yeah. Assuming the ice is out. Yeah. I believe it's the 29th, right? Town news just came out on that date. Okay. I think it's April 29th. Oh, okay. But it did hit town news, if not today, yesterday. It said today. It came out today. today. I saw it earlier. Uh, okay, uh, motion to adjourn. Anyone? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.